Shabbat Shalom. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to a nice rainy Shabbat. We got no place to go, right? Hi, uh, this week's parasha is Devarim, which means words. Deuteronomy chapter 1 through chapter 3. These are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel. In this parasha, we read the explanation of the Torah by Moses, beginning at Horeb. Moses retells what happened to the children of Israel the last 40 years. Moses reminds the children of Israel how he could not bear the burden of them by himself. So he had the people choose wise men among them to be heads of their tribes, to be their leaders. How he instructed them at that time to judge righteously, to not show partiality and judgment. He also reminds them that before the children of Israel would enter the promised land, they wanted to send out men to check out the land. So 12 men went out to bring back a report of what they saw. The report came back and it was said that it was a good land which the Lord is about to give them. But the children of Israel were not willing to go up and rebelled against the Lord. And because of this, the Lord became angry and took an oath saying, No one of these men, not this evil generation, shall see the good land which I swore to give their fathers except Caleb and Joshua. Moses reminded them that uh, after this, your fathers felt they had sinned against the Lord and tried to go up to fight just as the Lord wanted them to do in the beginning. But the Lord said, do not go up for I am not among you. I am not with you. But they did not listen and the Amorites chased them like bees and crushed them. So now that all the evil generation had passed away, the children of Israel now to begin to head towards their promised land. The Lord began to put the dread and fear of the children of Israel and all the peoples where they are about to go. Moses goes on to tell of the king of Sion and how the children of Israel defeated him and his people, how they captured all their land and all their cities, and how they destroyed every, everyone, leaving no survivors. They did the same thing to Og, the king of Bashan, thus taking the land of the two kings of the Amorites. The power shot ends with Moses telling of what he said to Joshua, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done for these two kings, to these two kings, so the Lord shall do to all the kingdoms in which you are about to cross. Do not fear them. The Lord your God is the one fighting for you. The Haftor portion this week comes from Isaiah 1 and speaks of the rebellion of God's people. It says, Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who acted corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Where will you be stricken again as, you're, you, as you continue in your rebellion? In Isaiah, it speaks of how the Lord despises His people's offerings, taking no pleasure in their sacrifices, how He hides His face when they pray and does not listen, how their incense is an abomination to Him and how He hates their appointed feasts. But the Lord says, Come now, let us reason together. Through your, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And I will be revived of my adversaries and avenge myself of my foes. I will restore your judges as the, at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness. In the New Covenant, we read the book, in the book of Ephesians, Paul insisting that as children of light, believers should no longer live as unbelievers do. For he states that unbelievers, Gentiles, have lost all sensitivity. They continually give themselves over to sensuality so that they can indulge in every kind of impurity with continual lust for more. More importantly, we as believers are to put off our old self, which continues to be corrupted, by its deceitful desires. We are to be made new in the attitude of our minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul urges us to continually seek the good of our fellow believers, whether it is by not sinning when we are angry or ceasing from stealing so that we have something to give someone who has need or through our communication, which should be wholesome so that those who hear may benefit and be edified. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord should be our daily desire and concern. Being imitators of the Holy God, acting like children of light and not of darkness. And continually producing the fruit of the Spirit, avoiding even the appearance of evil. Amen? Shofarim.
Thank you, Holy God, for this Shabbat. Thank you for every person that's here today, Father, to worship you. Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord. I give you honor today. I give you praise. Father, I pray in the name of Yeshua, Lord, that none of us would ever be given over to any kind of temptation, Lord. That we would always walk in the footsteps of your word. Wash us today, Lord God, with your holy water of your spirit, Lord. Wash our heads, our hands, our feet. Father, that we might sit here and hear what you have for us today, Lord. Father, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Allow your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to penetrate us. Father, I pray right now that you would anoint the word that goes forth. Father, that it would be food, living food for our souls. And I pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified as we worship you today. As we lift up our voices and honor you. Have your way in this service, Father. We give you honor today. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen, amen. Let us stand together. How lovely the tents of Jacob and your dwelling places of Israel. Shaft in my best son, me money, I yes, you were. Shaft in my best son, me money, I yes, you were. My, 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 oh, my best son, my, 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 oh, my best son, hey, hey. Oh my 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 best song my 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 best song shaft in my best song me money I yes you were shaft in my best song me money I yes you were my 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 oh my best song my 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 oh my best song hey oh hey Oh my 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 best song my oh my 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 best song therefore with joy we shall draw water from the wells of Yeshua amen amen and Shabbat Shalom all right we begin the Siddur with the Baruch Hu Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvarach Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Vayed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Bless me, Shiach Yeshua, together. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu, ederek hayeshua, b'mashiach Yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, Messiah Yeshua. Amen. We all stand for the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Shem 
kavon malkito leolam vayen shama Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavon Malkito Le'olam v'ayin. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of His glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Ve'hafta et Adonai lo'hecha, b'chol avavkov, chol nafshakav, chol madakam. V'hayu hadvarim ha'ele, asher anukim atavka ha'yom, al levavakam. Vishina Tanlevinak with the Bartabam, Vishifta Bevitakov, Uvlatka Vaderk, Ushapka Ukumeka, Ushar Tan the Old Ayadakam, Vahele Tutufo Ben and Nakam, Uktatam Azot Betakam, Uvisharakam. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Ve'avta l'riacha kamoka, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God who bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindnesses of the fathers, and brings a redeemer to his children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord, the resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save, who sustains the living with kindness, resurrects the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? Our God and God of our fathers, may be pleased with our rest. Sanctify us in your commandments and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness and make us rejoice in your salvation and purify our hearts to serve you in truth. In love and favor, O Lord our God, grant us a holy Shabbat as a heritage in May Israel, who sanctifies your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, Megadesh HaShabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and all say, Amen. Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded, be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is He, though He be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations, which are uttered in the world, and all say, Amen. May you make peace in His high places, make peace upon us, and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. 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 Bemadi Virkurti, Velmik Malkote, Bakai Konov, Yomokonov, Kai de Kol, Beit Israel, Bagalav Wisman Karivim Ru. Yesh Meraba, Mevarak, Lelam, or May, or Maya. Yet Barak Vishtapak, Vitba Avram Mamam, Vitna Savet the Dar, Vitalev Talel, Shmerkur Shabri Hu. 
Leon min kor bekata, vishra ta tush bekata, vinek mata damiram ba ma vimru. Amen. O se shalom bim ramav, hu ya se shalom aleinu, ve ya ko Yisrael, vimru, imru, amen. O se Shalom bim ramav, hu ya se shalom aleinu, ve ya ko Yisrael, vimru, imru, amen. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom. Shalom Aleinu, Viacho Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Viacho Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu. Viyako Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Viyako Yisrael. Amen, amen. May he who makes peace in high places make peace for Israel and for all mankind and say, Amen.
praise you, God. You are so holy. You are so worthy. And today, God, we do come and ask that you would empty us of everything, Father, that is not of you. Come and purge and refine us with your holy fire. Make us holy, Father, by the blood that was poured out on the cross and poured out in heaven on the altar for our sins. Make us pure and holy, clean, so we can stand in your holy presence. Receive our praises today, O oh God. We want to come in and bless you. We want to come in and pour out our praises on you, Almighty God, for you alone are worthy. Hallelujah.
We love you and thank you so much for the Shabbat, Father, for this Mishpacha, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this rainy day, Father, that nourishes the plants and the trees and everything around us. We pray, Lord, that our hearts and minds and our ears would be open to you, Lord, so that just like the rain outside, Father, that you'd send your Ruach to fill us up and to nourish us, to nourish our spirit this morning, Lord. We thank you so much for this nourishment you're about to send us that we'll receive, Lord. We pray that it will come forth from the rabbi and that nothing will stop us and get in our way, nothing will distract us, Lord. That we would just soak up your spirit and your nourishment today, Lord. We love you and thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Vai ben Soha Haron. When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Ya'amod, Yoel, ben Avraham, la Torah. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorak, Baruch Adonai Hamvorak le'olam va'en. Baruch et Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher b'cha b'nimikho, ha'amin v'lentan lanu et rato. Baruch et Adonai noten ha'torah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Yeladim. So for those that may be watching this on the internet, this is a time in which we invite Hayeladim, Hebrew for the children of Rosh Pina, and we pray a weekly blessing over each and every one of them. But first we say, Boker Tov, Yeladim. A little louder. One more time. Okay. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, for these blessed children, the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that a hedge of protection be placed around each and every one of them, O Lord, keeping them safe from sickness, keeping them safe from harm's way, O Lord. Lord, I ask also as they mature physically and grow, that spiritually, Lord, they will be drawn to you. They will realize that you are the Mashiach, and Lord, that they would receive you as their Messiah. They're such a blessing to us, O oh Lord. We ask that you surround them with godly men and women who will assist them on their life's journey. In Yeshua's name, Amen. amen. Elei <laughs> Hadevarim, Asher the Dober Moshe El Kal Yisrael Ba'ever Hayarden Bamidbar Barava Mul Suf Ben Paran Uven Tufel Ulavan Vechasorot Vadi Zahab Achar Asar Yom Nechor Mekarev Derek Har Sair Ad Kadesh Barnea Vahi Barbaim Shana Beashte Asar Chodesh Beechad Le Chodesh Diber Moshe El Bene Israel Kakol Asher Tiva Adonai Oto Alehem These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel. We're switching because. Ben and Katie are having their uh, wedding celebration coming up, and he's coming to the Torah to read the weekly Torah portion. So you Thank continue you. on. All right. 
These be the words Can which... Can we do Hebrew first? No. <laughs> I, I haven't practiced. <laughs> These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on the side Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab, there are eleven days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the fourteenth year, in the eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. Amen. Amen. Blessing after Torah reading. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Torati Met Vechaye Olam Nata Batechenu Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who gave us the Torah of Truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, Giver of the Torah. Vezot HaTorah Vezot HaTorah Asher Shem Moshe Lifnei Bnei Yisrael Al Pi Adonai Biad Moshe And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God. Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God's word is written on lambskin. Yeshua is this lamb. In John 12, 32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Yitzchayim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Amen. Yitzchayim Him. Yitzchayim He L'mazachim Ba. Vatom ker mushar, drakeer darke no am vakol na tivateha shalom. Hashavenu adonai lakav na shuva kadesh menu kikinem. Is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, adonai, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2 7 reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. May be seated. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So as has already been noted, we've seen this morning, um, we turn to the last book of the Torah in the Parashot cycle for the year, um, Davarim, of course, you know, commonly known in Christian circles in the West is Deuteronomy, which translates into English the second giving of the law in essence. But of course, like I said, you know, in Hebrew, it's davarim, it's words. Um, that would be the translation um, into English. And when I was reflecting on this title last night, you know, words, brought to mind a teaching I had done in the past. It didn't relate directly to these chapters in Deuteronomy or, De or Devarim, but specifically on the word, word. And when we talk about the word, you know, oftentimes we use that meaning all of scripture. 
We use it as a word from God, you know, a message from God. Um, assumption is whether it be scripture or, you know, an individual or a corporate message that it's something that comes directly from God. But probably the most well-known meaning right out of the scripture is when we think of the word was as the title of the message up there on the screen would suggest, but in the beginning was the Word. So I did a teaching on this a few, uh, while back, and I was actually trying to remember how long ago it was, so um, since I save all my past teachings on my computer, I looked it up, and it was actually been six years since I taught about what is the Word. When, when, we, when we read that in the beginning was the Word, what is that actually referring to? And so I thought it might be time, it might be beneficial to do this teaching again. Uh, it's been, like I said, it's been six years. And there's new members who weren't here that would have heard it. Probably most of you have forgotten it. Um, I know Kathy hasn't because she's always, she, she was a big fan of this teaching and every once in a while will bring it up again to me. But um, I thought it would be good because it's, it's a beneficial teaching because ultimately what it does, what I hope it does, is that it should broaden our understanding of who Yeshua is. And ultimately it should deepen our understanding of the nature of God. Now this teaching, though, it requires us to exercise our brains. You're going to have to put on your thinking caps this morning with me. Because in this message, we're going to the deep end of the pool. Because we're going to focus, like I said, almost exclusively on the meaning of the word, word. And so, so doing so, we're going to enter into the realms of theology, philosophy, history, entomology, all those things that I really enjoy and I get passionate about studying. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh, time to dial into my dream ministry. This one's not for me. Um, I, know, I get it. I'm the odd individual who gets excited about pursuing these types of studies. But I encourage you to stay with me this morning. Because, again, I'm hoping what you will get from this teaching is a deeper and broader understanding of who Yeshua is when we say that Yeshua is God. And I also hope it brings also a deeper understanding to what the purpose of his ministry was beyond his death and resurrection, which obviously is the primary focus of his ministry, the primary purpose why he came to earth. And if he had done nothing like other than die on the cross and then rise from the dead, Dianu, it would have been enough. But... His ministry did more than just that. And I, I think by delving into this, we can get a better understanding of what Yeshua was accomplishing during his time on earth. And in doing so, what we're also going to discover is that this idea of the word being there at the beginning, the word being with God, the word being God, and that being when it became flesh, being Yeshua... It's often accused by rabbinic Jews and by secular and atheist scholars that, well, this was a Christian invention. This was something that the Christians took from pagan thought, and they added it to their beliefs. But what I'm actually going to show you is that it, this idea of the word, and again, the word being there at the beginning, being with God and being God, this actually takes root in Jewish understanding about the nature of God. It takes root in how the nature of God is expressed in the Tanakh. But unfortunately, it's an understanding that it's, it's, it's throughout the entire scriptures, the rabbis have abandoned it. And they've actually come against it over time. And we'll show all of that this morning. So let's begin. I've already stated it several times, but let's hear it one more time. The central verse of this morning, John 1.1, 1, 1, which states... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, we all know this verse. Anyone who grew up, um, especially in any type of denomination, any type of church, knows this verse. You can probably recite it from memory. As Jason was reading it, you were probably actually in your mind going ahead of him reciting it. But if I were to ask you, what is this Word? What does that mean? He was the Word. 
that the word was there in the beginning, that it was with God and it was God. What, what does that mean? What, like, tell me in your own words what that means. Could you say it beyond just reciting the verse back to me, acknowledging the truth that's there, but could you really tell me what that means? What's John expressing when, about God and about Yeshua when he says this, when he writes this? But in order to answer these questions, we first have to go back to the original language in which John wrote his gospel, which of course was Greek. Now we'll get to Hebrew later on, but we've got to start with the Greek because that's what John was writing in. And the word that he uses here, you know, he doesn't write word, that's English. Many will know this is, the Greek word is logos. And that is a very good translation into English, saying word. But we have to realize that when we typically use the word word, and we think about, well, what do we mean when we say word? Not just in, uh, you know, not relating directly here to scripture, to what John's after here, but just in our normal day language. We'll actually soon to discover, and this is what, by using the word Greek term logos gets us to, is that this word is actually a very complicated, it has multiple levels of meaning to it. And especially when you go back into ancient philosophy, um, the, the philosophy that was being written at the time of Yeshua, the centuries before and after it, you find that there are books, there are pages and pages and pages of ancient uh, Eastern Mediterranean philosophers who are wrestling this, with this question of what is this logos, this concept of the logos. And I want to do a little quick exercise with all of you to, get, to give you a sense of what they mean by logos. Because logos does not simply mean the word, like when I speak a word, like if I say table, you know, you audibly hear the, the word table. If I was to write it you, in English, you would see T-A-B-L-E. That's the word. But when we talk about the logos, we're talking about something much deeper than just the letters that make it up or the sounds that are, are, are said when you, when, when you say the word. So to help you get, get to this, I want to do this um, exercise. So I want all of you to close your eyes for a couple seconds. And I'm going to say a word. And when I say the word, I want you to visualize the, an object that you associate with that word. And when you're visualizing it, you know, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to really think about whatever pops into your mind. And I want you to think about well, what does it look like? How big or small is it? What materials is it made of? What colors um, is it made of? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it rough? You know, think about all those things. So I want you to visualize chair. You've all thought of, you all had an image in your head. Now I want you to take a minute, turn to the person next to you, and tell them what you visualized. Describe it. Give them details about what you visualized. When you were describing to your neighbor, when you each were describing what you visualized, did the chairs in your minds look the same? No, they're probably different. Some of you may have envisioned a felt, very soft, 
fluffy chair that you would sink into. Others may have visualized a hard wooden chair or a plastic chair that, you know, some may have thought of a lounge chair, um, maybe even something along the lines of, a, you know, bigger as a love seat or something. Others would have visualized, you know, a hard wooden, almost like stool-like object. So, and all kinds of different colors. Now, I, I'm kind of curious if maybe how many, I'm just curious, how many people had purple chair, had a purple chair in mind? Because I wondered how much, because you're sitting in purple chairs, that might bias what came to your mind when I said it in this moment. Now, the reason I've done all this is there was differences, but were there, any, were there similarities between your things as well, as you described it? At the very least, I'm assuming you all described something upon which somebody would sit on. So there's that similarity. All right, now the reason I do this is because what we just did, it should help us to understand more deeply what we mean by word. Because there's really two, at, least, at a minimum, there's two levels here of conceptualization in play. At the first just surface level, we have, like I said before, we have the word chair. When I speak it, the audible sound, the ch air. You have, again, if I was to write it, the C-H-I-R um, for, for it. Now that is a word. If, you, if I wrote it up, you would say, and I said, what is this? Not read it, but what is this? And you could say, it's a word. That's not what logos is. There's a different Greek word that's used to describe just the letters or the sound of the word. That's lexis. So logos means something different. It's a much more deep and it's a much more complex level of what does a word actually represent. And that's what all of you were doing. When you were described, you visualized, I said chair, you visualized something in your head of what that word meant to you, what meaning did you associate with it, and then you described it to each other and you found out, oh, there's maybe different meaning there for each person who describes it. There's differences, but at the same time, there's also a true universal meaning. There is a common meaning to the word. Otherwise, if we didn't have common shared meaning in, in, the, in the words we used, um, we wouldn't be able to ever understand each other. It's probably the problem why there's so much confusion and, and ups, disagreement in society because we're, we use words but we mean different things anymore. I mean, you can't even, what does male and female even mean? You know, society's just uh, um, turned over that cart. We, don't, we, we get into all this confusion. And so for example, like I asked you to visualize chair, you all had different types of chairs um, in your mind, but again, when the person was describing their vision to you, even though it was different, you knew they were describing a chair, right? And that's because there is still this one true or universal, um, in philosophy we, we call it the phenomenological essence of that, of that entity. Um, what is a chair? It's an object designed specifically for humans to sit on for support. I mean, at that most basic level, every one of your visions and every one of your descriptions was describing that. The, all this meaning that we put behind the word, that, that sits behind the word, that's the logos. And so, in its, in, its, in its most pure and simplistic form, the logos is the true meaning contained in that word when we, read, when we speak it, when we write it, when we read it. It's all the meanings, all the assumptions that we carry and we hold when we come across a word. So if this is the case, what was John saying then when he said the logos was in the beginning? It was with God, and it was God. Well, again, like I, like I said at the beginning, we have to realize that John is trying to express a Jewish thought here, but it's difficult because he's using Greek words to do it. He's not using Hebraic words. And because he's writing his gospel to a much broader audience, and so that's why he chose Greek to write it in, he had to find a Greek word to express this Jewish idea. And logos ends up fitting, in, in, that he takes from the Greek, it fits the bill. It really does work for what he was trying to express because logos, that being the meaning behind the words that we speak, it actually ends up taking on multiple meetings then. It's very complex and it's, and it's multifaceted in what it means. And you're going to find at the end of the teaching, I'm going to have summarize in about, it takes about eight bullet points to really say what is meant by this word logos. 
So again, for for the for the, the Greeks, logos meant again the meaning behind the word. It also represented order. It represented knowledge, reason, discourse. Simply sitting down and holding a re discourse of on reason that was considered engaging in the logos. It was seen also by certain Greek philosophical schools as they would talk about this divine logos, the divine animating principle behind the universe, behind everything we see physically. The Stoics, which was one group of Greek philosophers, they called it the anima mundi, which in Greek means the word soul or the, word, the, the world's soul or the world's spirit. Again, it's the meaning, it's the essence behind what we see physically. So, in other words, when, when, when using the word logos, one of the central meanings of this is it's the meaning of the universe that exists behind the physical creation which we're able to observe and interact with. Now, I hope you're still with me because, again, we're kind of getting into the deep pool and some philosophical thoughts here. And some may want to object at this point saying, wait, you're going to all this Greek philosophy. Haven't you taught from the Bema yourself, and I have, that it takes a Jewish mind and not a Greek mind to truly understand the scriptures? So why are you worried about all this Greek? And, this, and if this is so, if it does take a Jewish mind, why are we even wor worried about what these Greeks, these pagan-derived philosophies came up with in terms of the Lagos? After all, wouldn't we just say this logos that we're talking about is an invention of man? It just comes out of the dreams and the thoughts of men? Well, yes and no. Because what's important here is not whether or not the Greeks were actually correct in their philosophies, but what was a Jewish man who is filled with the Ruach trying to convey about the ineffable, the undescribable nature of God? What was John doing when he uses this word? What were the scribes who translated the Tanakh into Septuagint, who used the, this word, the Lagos, many times throughout um, the Torah and throughout the prophets when they're translating it into Greek? What were, what were they thinking using this word? Also, we're going to look at what was the Jewish philosopher of, um, like Philo trying to convey. He writes about this concept of the Lagos. What were they all trying to convey that they understood from the, from the Jewish scriptures, from the, the, the writings of the Tanakh? using this Greek word. And by looking at other Jewish sources from the immediate centuries before and after Yeshua's time on earth, we can really start to see what they were trying to convey and what John is trying then to convey. So first, the scribes who translated the Tanakh from Hebrew to Greek, remember that's called the Septuagint. Um, again, like I said, they used the term logos multiple times. And, and most often when they use it, they are translating the Hebrew word davar, which we get davarim, the, the, the parasha this week. Now davar is much more like the English word word, in that it doesn't, unlike the Greeks who split up these two levels of meaning between the lexis and the logos, just the plain audible or visual representation of the word versus the meaning behind the word. In Hebrew, they use davar, and it, it can take on both meanings there. So what we have to do is we have to go searching through the Septuagint, looking, well, okay, well, where do they use logos? Again, they're often translating davar as logos. Not always. Sometimes they translate davar as lexis. So you can see in their minds, they were distinguishing between these two concepts, though. So let's use a few examples where we see from the Septuagint, of course we're going to read it in English, but you just got to trust me, if you were reading it in the Greek, they would be used, the, the rabbis and the scribes were using logos when you hear words in these verses. So first of all, we have Proverbs 18.4 that states, The words of a person's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. So the words or the logos of a man's mouth are deep waters. Meaning it's just not what he speaks, that there's just this surface level of it, that it's just this plain, literal, everybody understands exactly the same thing. They're deep rot waters, there's lots and lots of meaning behind the words that we speak. The Septuagint also expresses how a man's heart responds to God's commandments, and that this is related to the Logos. Proverbs 4.4 4 states, 
He taught me and said to me, let your heart take hold of my words, keep my commandments and live. So we hear there, the heart is where the logos, now if the logos is the meaning, the heart is where the logos, the meaning of the commandments is retained. It's where it's kept, it's where life will exist if it is kept there. I mean, that gets into the, everything that we know from, you know, the, the, from the Tanakh about needing to have circumcised, um, circumcised hearts and that the word has to penetrate into it and it has to reside there. But it's, again, it's just not the plain textual meaning. You can memorize the entire Torah, but if you don't understand the meaning behind it, it's worthless to you. Tying the idea of the Lagos to the commandments as a source of life. We also read the following in Deuteronomy 32, 45 through 47. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to your heart all the words which I am warning you today, which you will command your sons to follow carefully, all the words of this law, for it is not a trivial matter for you. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word you will prolong your days in the land, which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Now these three verses, this passage is really nice and trying to really get to what I'm emphasizing here about what the Logos is because you have, the, you have word used several times here. In verse 45, when they were translating into Greek, they don't use Logos. When it says, Moses finished speaking all these words. It doesn't use the plural of Logos there. It uses that other meaning, Lexus. You know, just the surface. Moses spoke forth these audible words. But then after that, the other times it speaks about the word here, then they switch to using logos. Again, expressing the deeper, life-giving understanding of the words of the law. That if you understand the meaning behind the law, then you will have this fountain of life that's given to you. In addition to the use of Lagos as the meaning and the teachings of the law, what the law really means, it also presents, um, it's also used to present the act of creation by God in the Tanakh. So in Psalm 33, 6 we read, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth all their lights. So by the word, by the Lagos of the Lord the heavens were made. So not just by the spoken word of God, but by the logos, by the meaning, the, that animating force behind the words that were spoken by God, it was that that caused creation to leap into being. That out of nothing, all of a sudden, just by God speaking it, again, not because he, there was, you know, that, not just because he, there was an audible speaking of words, but the meaning, the force, the, the spirit behind those words, that's what caused creation to leap forward. And this later understanding of the Logos, that being the force behind creation, this is what we find in the writings of the Jewish philosopher Philo. And again, he lived at the same time of Yeshua. Um, he lived in the large Jewish community of Alexandria, Egypt. And Philo described specific aspects of the nature of God as belonging to a divine Logos. Specifically, Philo conceived of God as being holy. That's obviously a very Jewish concept, very idea, because it comes right out of the scriptures. And so he sees God as being holy. He's spiritual. He sees him being completely as spiritual. But therefore, now this is where Philo starts to kind of drift into Greek philosophy, though. He says that, it, because the Greeks had this concept, that because God is holy and separate and spirit only, he couldn't interact directly with his creation. That the physical material world, there was too big of a gulf between what God had created and, and God himself that God couldn't interact with it. So in line with a lot of Greek thinking, Philo argued that there was an, in, like I said, this insurmountable gap. But the problem he ran to as a Jew was that when he read the Tanakh, when he read the Holy Scriptures, it's filled with all of these examples where the divine presence actually does enter into and interact with the creation. So Philo had to reconcile the examples he saw in Scripture with, with the Greek philosophy he also was buying into. So he conceptual, he uses this idea of the Logos 
And he conceptualized the Logos as an aspect of God. And he, and he even says this, and it's, it's, it's fascinating because he was writing a little, he would have been writing before John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Philo's writing saying this Logos, this divine animating spirit, is both God and separate from God. So the idea is right there, before John even writes it. And he says that this Logos then acted as an intermediary, as being both separate and being part of God. It acts as an intermediate that can all of a sudden, that can bridge this gap between God in his pure essence, his true nature, being fully spirit and separate from everything, separate from his creation and the creation itself. Thus, Philo goes through and he, and he starts pointing to all these examples that where we see inter God interacting with individuals in scripture. When Avraham is visited by the three, um, the three angels or men, one of them we know was God. It says right there in the scripture that, that it was Yehovah, and therefore that was the Logos. When God appears before Moses in the burning bush, and, and when the bush was on flame, that was the Logos. When the, the Shekinah, the, 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 the holy resting presence of God, filled the tabernacle in the days of Solomon, that was the Logos. Every time we see God entering into his creation and interacting directly with it, that's the Logos. And much of the language that Philo used to describe the Logos mirrors the scriptures we have of Yeshua. But, but interestingly enough, we actually also see sometimes it also relates to the Holy Spirit, to the Ruach, as it's described in the New Testament. Philo said that the Logos was present in the act of creation. And that it was the anima animating bond that was held, that held the universe together. He claimed the Logos was the name of God, but also a second God. Again, but, which sounds strange, because, I mean, as a Jew, he was certainly a strict monotheist, and he would have, you know, the Shema, there is one God, um, and there is none other, but he still sees, again, it, it's, it's hard to describe, but he was trying to describe, he, it is with God, but it also is God. He called the Logos the heavenly Adam. He called it the heavenly high priest. He called it the medi mediator and the advocate or the paraclete. He also argued that when God said that man should be created in his image, back in Genesis 1, he was speaking specifically, that image was specifically the Logos, which was the image or the outline of God. Much of this language reflects what Paul would express about Yeshua in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, again, one, I could see, I could hear someone arguing that, well, why are we, again, dealing with Philo? Okay, yeah, we can start to see a lot of parallels between what Philo was describing as the Logos and then what the New Testament writers are writing about Yeshua. But again, why listen to Philo? Because when you read Philo, his full intent is to try to harmonize Greek philosophy with the scriptures, the Tanakh. But Philo's not alone in seeing this connection here. Other Jewish sources from the same time period also point to the Logos as being the part of God that was involved in the act of creation. In the apocryphal book called The Wisdom of Solomon, which was written about a century before Yeshua was on the earth, the Logos is tied to the concept of wisdom, which is described as being light. And it's described as proceeding from God and being the true image of God, being the co-occupant of the divine throne, and being a source of immortality and healing. Again, all things we associate with Yeshua. These descriptors parallel closely both the description of Yeshua being the word, but also being the light, as John states in 1, 3 through 5. All things came into being through him, and apart from him not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. So we have it there from John. We also find it again in the Tanakh, this, um, this, this, this tying together of the Logos, 
the wisdom and, um, and this aspect of God. In Proverbs 8, 22 through 30, the divine, listen to the divine attributes that are, are, that are attributed to wisdom. The Lord created me at the beginning of his way. When it says the Lord created, or other translations may say possessed me at the beginning, the me is wisdom. That's what's being spoken of here. Before his works of old, from eternity I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth, when there was no ocean depths, I was born, when there was no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was born, while he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there, when he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set a boundary for the sea so that the water would not violate his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was his delight daily, rejoicing always before him. So here again we see, you know, wisdom here being described as being a participant in the act of creation. And then, like I said, this, this work from like the first century BC, this wisdom of Solomon, which is written by uh, an unknown Jewish author, but we see that in the, the Jews of that day understood that wisdom and logos, these are attributes of God that are interacting with the creation. Now finally, I'll also go to the immediate periods before and after Yeshua's time on earth to see how this concept of Logos was also being expressed when we, when we turn to the Targums. And the Targums are commentaries by rabbis of, of, that, of that age. Um, and they're commentaries on various books of the Tanakh. Now in these commentaries, the rabbis don't use the word Logos. Instead, they use an, uh, an Aramaic word, Memra. But Memra is Aramaic for word. So it translates the same. And in these commentaries, we see the Memra possessing the same qualities that we see file in the Book of Wisdom ascribing to the Logos, in which the New Testament writers reveal as being aspects of Yeshua. In fact, the Memra is used for the Theophanies, the prophetic revelations, and all other manifestations of God that are seen in the Tanakh. It is also used as a replacement at times for Yehovah, Yoh the Yehovah, the actual name of God, they actually use Memra to replace it at times. Just like today where Jews would say Adonai or Hashem to, for the name, back then they would actually use this term Memra, meaning word, as a replacement. Just to give you a flavor of this, here's several examples. In Genesis 39:21, it states, But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the warden of the prison. So it says, the Lord, that being the Yehovah, the Lord was with Joseph. In one of the Targums, we find the rabbi saying, the Memra was with Joseph in the prison. In Psalm 110, 1 through 4, we read, Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch out your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely on the day of your power. In holy splendor from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So right there, the Lord said to my Lord, Yoh you know, Yohavah said to my, my master, you know, Yohavah said to Adonai, um, my Lord, my master, there, one of the Targums, a rabbi writes that this is God addressing the Memra. It's addressing the, you could say it's addressing the Lagos, the word. Now keep in mind, these, this was the very verse or passage that Yeshua would use when he was challenged by the, when he challenged the religious leaders to explain, well why, because David's the one speaking here in, um, in Psalm 110, and Yeshua says, well, why did David say the Lord said to my Lord? How do, you, how do we make sense of that? And they couldn't answer him. And Yeshua was pointing that God was speaking to the, the, the other Lord is to Yeshua, the Mashiach, there. And so we see, again, all this tying together. 
Finally, the Targums also state that the Memra was in the pillar of the cloud of fire that led the Israelites out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Of course, this reflects Paul's own assertion about the Messiah that we find in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. And they were, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock was the Messiah. So Yeshua talk, I mean, Paul there talks about how everything was provided out of the cloud and that there was this spiritual rock that was with them. And he says that rock was the Mashiach, that it was Yeshua. And again, in Jewish thought, we have from the Targums that they understood that the, what they called the Memra, what we would call the Logos or the Word, it was in the pillar of the cloud there. Because again, in their understanding, the Memra was any instance in which they saw God interacting in his creation. Now in all of this, we see that the concept of Yeshua being the Lagos or the Memra, it is a Jewish concept that they had developed in their attempt to understand how God as an infinite and a spiritual and a holy or separate being could enter into his finite physical creation. And how is it that he could interact with it? It wasn't a new concept that was created by John or the followers of Yeshua, nor was it one that was borrowed from pagan idolatry and philosophy, but rather it was an attempt to explain the nature of God as it was, had been revealed in the Tanakh to a Greek mind in a language that they could understand. Now regrettably, most Jews do not know this about the ancient Jewish writings, because in the Middle Ages, the rabbis, and specifically the Rambam, they began to diminish the meaning of the Mamra. They, essentially, they wanted to sweep it away. And the reason they did this is because what occurred in the 12th century is Catholic, Catholic theologians who were trying to, to argue against the Jews and to convert them to Catholicism, they began to actually read the Talmud. They had neglected it for up in, for like a thousand, almost a thousand years. Now, this time they began to actually read it because they wanted to start looking and see, well, can we find in their own writings, the writings that the rabbis and the Jews are using, could we find arguments in there that we could use against them to try to get them to turn towards Christ? And in response to this, because they were finding all these, they found the Memra, they found these Jewish, these ancient Jewish writings, and they immediately said, well, this is the Lagos, this is what we're, John is describing in his gospel here. So they began to argue against the rabbis about this. But then the rabbis responded, unfortunately, by then diminishing and, like I said, trying to sweep these ancient writings away because they couldn't explain it away. Well, they, they saw the connections and they had difficulty. So they then changed the Mamra to simply mean, it's, yeah, it's a name of God, we acknowledge that, but that's all it is. It's just something that describes one of God's attributes. But there's nothing special about it. It's not describing, you know, God entering into his creation or anything. They divorced those earlier concepts of the Memra of the Lagos being the part of the divine nature that served as the intermediary between God and his creation and also was involved in the act of creation itself. And unfortunately, you, you read this today, many rabbis or Jewish philosophers, they will say, well, we reject the idea that God could become man, as you Christians try to say, because, and they go back, well, it's ironic, because they actually go back to the old Greek argue, philosophical arguments saying, God is completely separate from his creation. He can't enter into it. They reject that very idea. And then they go through the Tanakh, and you say, well, what about this example, and this example, and this example? Um, and they'll, they'll say, no, 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 that's not God interacting, that's an angel interacting, or that is, you know, God giving the appearance that he's interacting, but it's really something different. They, they try to brush all of that away. So, but when we read then, let's come back to this verse, though, that we have in John. When we read that the word was in the beginning, and it was with God and it was God. We can now begin to more fully grasp who Yeshua is when we say that he is God. Now all attempts by, by humans to really tr fully describe this, everyone's going to fail. We can, this is something beyond our understanding, our comprehension. 
I hope that when we're in Alam Haba and we're in the heavenly Jerusalem and in his presence, we may finally grasp it. I'm going to guess we still may not fully grasp it. That may be part of what we're going to be doing for all eternity, is trying to fully, and not grasp it just because we want to satisfy ourselves, but so that we can fully worship and appreciate and understand the presence that we're going to be dwelling in. We're going to be focused on this. But in this day and age, every metaphor, every analogy, every word study, every theological treatise, they're all going to fail to fully describe what is going on when the word became flesh, when, when God entered into his creation in this one unique way that's different from all the other times he did that we see in the Tanakh, in that he actually took on human flesh, took on attributes of man, and became, and, and became Yeshua. Fully understanding he's still on the throne when he's here on the earth as Yeshua. He's still completely on the throne as well, ruling as sovereign over all of creation. But we can start, to, when we do a study like this, we can start to gain some more complete, some more understanding of what is being expressed and who Yeshua is as God. We, we can help begin to wrestle with these concepts of logos, of memra, of word. We see Yeshua as the enemy, again, that intermediary aspect of God between his infinite self and his finite creation. We can see how he also, Yeshua, is the force behind the creation of the world. He's also the image of God in which we are all created. And he's the wisdom of the, and he is the word of God that resides in our hearts and turns it to living flesh. But not just the word again in the sense of Lexus, that is the letters and sounds that make up the word, but he is the word in the sense of the logos. He is the meaning behind the words given to Moses. Behind the meat, when we read the words that are on the pages of our Bibles, he is the meaning behind those words. He's behind, he's the meaning behind the commandments, he's the meaning behind all the personal stories we read, he's the meaning behind all the grand events we read of in the Torah. This aspect of Yeshua being the true meaning and the true spirit or force behind the Torah can be seen in his, teach, in his own teachings about how he sought to apply the law. I'm going to use the example of Matthew because that's where we see it best. We all, we, let, let's recall the following verses that are in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, 27 through 28, and 31 through 45. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder. And whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be answerable to the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now it was said, whoever sends his wife away is to give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, take no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you take an oath by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. But make sure your statement is yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil origin. You have heard, you have heard that it is said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not show opposition against an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other toward him also. And if anyone wants to sue you, take your tunic and let him have your cloak also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now in these teachings here, these instances, we continually hear Yeshua saying, you have heard it said. And what he's referring to, sometimes he refers directly to passages that are in the Tanakh, or he refers to teachings that came out of those passages from the Tanakh. But he's saying, you have heard it said. In essence, he's addressing the Lexus, that surface level. You've heard these words. You physically have heard them, or you've read them on a page. But then he says, but I say to you, and what he's saying there is, I'm going to tell you what those words mean. What is the logos of those words? Yeshua is not changing any of the commandments here. He's not doing away with any of them. This is what our Christian brothers and sisters get wrong about these, these, these passages here. They think Yeshua is changing the law or he's doing away with it. If he did that, he, he's not the Messiah. They need to wake up and realize that. But what he's doing rather is he's saying, you have these words, these plain words, You've ascribed certain meaning to them. You've got the meaning wrong. Let me now show you what the actual meaning of these words are. What is the logos behind the words? He's describing, he's providing the logos because he is the logos that is behind those words. Those words that Moses or the prophets spoke, yeah, they spoke plain words in Hebrew, but now I'm going to tell you what the meaning of those words are. I'm going to tell you how to apply them in your everyday lives and what God, what I was truly after in terms of your hearts and how you're to love one another and love God when I gave you those words. He's in fact doing exactly what he said he had come to do in Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the small, smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Not one stroke, not one jot or two, not any mark of the law, he says, can pass away. And the reason it can't, you want to know the true reason it can't? You know, someone in history could have went back to a very early copy and could have erased or, or marked out something and tried to destroy it. And then all the copies afterward, proceeding afterward, could have been altered. But that's the Lexus. That's just the surface words. The meaning, the logos behind that, nothing of that can pass away. None of that can be destroyed because even if, if somehow you were able to gather every copy um, physical and electronical of, every, of, of the scripture in every language on earth and destroy it, the word still remains. The logos is still there. It is always there. It can't be, um, it cannot pass away until all is fulfilled. And so in conclusion, Yeshua is called the logos by John. These are, um, I've got six bullet points here that I want you to understand. All of this is the meaning behind that. The Logos is the aspect of God that was the force or the agent behind creation. When God spoke the words, the, 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 the animating force behind it that caused the creation to leap forward is the Logos, the Word. The light of God, which contrasts against the darkness, that's the Logos as well. The image of God, that very image in which we were made, that's the Logos. The aspect of God that bridges the gap between himself as spirit and his creation, which then which interacts with the creation in all of its manifestations, whether it's a theophany, it's a, the Shekinah, it's a word heard by the prophets, or it's when the word became flesh, all of that is the Logos, because it's God bridging that gap. The Logos is the wisdom and the true life-giving purpose of the Torah. It's the meaning, but it's also that meaning gives life, as Moses asserted. And the Lagos 
It's the very same thing that the Jewish sages and rabbis of centuries immediately preceding and following Yeshua referred to as Memra. It's in their writings. They understood this concept, this aspect of God. But unfortunately, like I said, over the centuries, it's been brushed away. It's been brushed under the rug. Now hopefully this helps all of us appreciate who Yeshua truly is. At least appreciate it more. And even more so, it helps us appreciate the love that God demonstrated for his creation. Because when he did bridge that gap, in this very unique way, when Yeshua walked the earth, when he became flesh, we see what God was willing to do out of love for his creation, as was described by John in 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. His love was so great that he came, you know, he had bridged it many times, but he bridged it in this very different way when he came as Yeshua. He came in the flesh, to, as he, the Hebrew says, to live and to experience and know what it was like to be man and therefore then be able to be our high priest to become, he's the mediator that bridges that gap, but, but now he also becomes the mediator on the cross to bridge the gap that sin had created between man and God as well, this additional gap that had been created. And when we begin to fully understand that God does this for us when we didn't deserve it at all, we can truly begin to understand how important this phrase is when um, John opens his gospel saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation, for he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs, and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow, and acknowledge our thanks before the King over kings, the Holy One, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. The seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our King, there is nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, and you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is none other. Amen. Giving, ever 
ever loving, you remain the same. For you open up your hand and satisfy. I give you all the glory. Give you all the glory. You are worthy, O oh Lord, of all.
Send up our praise to you today, Lord. We love you and thank you for this time to worship you, Father. We thank you for your word, Father, that lives inside of us, Lord. We pray that as we read your words and speak your truth and speak out your, your words, Lord, that they would come to life and everyone around us, Lord. We just pray that those words in your spirit would dwell in us, Lord, dwell inside of us. Bring healing to us all, Lord. We pray as we go through our week, Lord, that you would continue to be with us and lead us, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you do for us each day, Lord. Every day, an opportunity to lift you up in praise and worship. To worship the one true God and King. We love you and thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Be seated for announcements. As always, we will uh, have uh, yeshiva uh, this week, uh, 7:30 to 9, as well as youth group um, on this Wednesday, 7:30 to 9. For yeshiva, please have read Luke 15 and 16. Uh, also on the back table, we have our sign-ups uh, for our annual uh, Rosh Pinan picnic, which is occurring July 31st, which is a Saturday. Uh, we'll have our normal Shabbat service and then lead right into the picnic on the 31st. So please uh, sign up for that, both your name or family name, and then also the side dish you're bringing. Of course, as we asked before, as we always ask everyone to bring um, a package of hot dogs as well. And then also uh, there will be sign-ups next week for calendars. So be looking forward to that. Just like uh, past many, many years, uh, the price will range depending on how many we get between 10 to $15. So I will have more of an understanding of what that cost will be once we have a sign up list. Okay? So just look for that next week. And I believe that's all the announcements I have. Je oh, Ima? Awesome. Awesome. And as we normally do, if then everybody else can go into the Oneg room, keep the doors closed, and try to keep the uh, talking, or not talking, but keep the sound uh, a little lower so we can keep a, a sanctuary quiet for the prayers. Uh, but just reminders, the Daka Box and Backs for tithes, offerings, donations. Alongside here to the left is your praise reports and prayer requests. And as we go into Oneg, let's say the Bracha together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lecha min haaretz ba'ashem Yeshua Hamashiach. Amen. Shavuot tov.